And we are live with our 54th episode of Absolute AppSec. I'm Ken Johnson at CK Tricky on Twitter, joined by my co host, Seth Law at Seth Law on Twitter. Seth, say hi. Hey, everybody. Welcome once again to Absolute AppSec. Uh, we're really excited about today's episode. Um, especially all the all the research that Tim has done on the burp suite side of things, right? Uh, I know for most of us in the industry, burp suite's kind of a, a necessary tool, sometimes a necessary evil at times. So being able to use it better or tips and tricks is always a great thing to have. Um, but, uh, you know, we're excited to just uh, be here, have the discussion that Tim's joining us. Uh, before we jump into that, uh, we typically do our AppSec Minute think we're going to skip it today in lieu of actual burp discussion and we'll jump back to the top 10 web hacking web web hacking techniques uh, next week um, I think that's also because Ken didn't have any research he was off doing yoga or something like that this morning so, you know. no actually it's because we have a pretty hard stop today and uh, we've got a lot to get from get out of Tim's brain so yeah. we kind of need to pack pack the uh, make the time Make the time count. Yeah. Um, outside of that, before we jump in and kind of introduce Tim a little bit more, uh, training for uh, AppSec Global in Israel is coming up. Ken and I are doing our you know adventures in secure code review. Um, feel free to jump in on that. Uh, we do have the live chat running as always, both YouTube and on Slack. So if anyone wants to get into either of those, feel free to jump in and ask Tim questions or ask questions, whatever. Um, but I think that's everything from an announcement perspective. Uh, Ken, unless there's something else you wanted to go into. No, I think we can uh, go right, I'll go right into uh, introducing Tim so we can get this conversation started. We got a lot to cover. So, uh, well, both you and I, Seth, worked with Tim uh, at um, a former security consulting company. Yep. Um, a let's see so i knew tim before that i had met tim through um sans and uh he was teaching he, he taught for a long time with sans now he owns his own training company which is good he's really good at training p whopped uh, he'll talk i'm sure a little bit about that um but yeah so tim has written recon ng it's a huge framework for um basically doing your homework on uh your your um on the targets you're attacking um, he's done, like I said, a lot of training. He's spoken at a lot of conferences, Black Hat, DEF CON, Derby CON, et cetera. Um, let's see, he's been doing web hacking for, how long have you been doing this, Tim? Long time, I, I'd assume. Specifically application security, probably going on about 10 years now. I did the general, the general security thing for a really long time when I was with the government and then when I first got out. But uh, when I moved on from, uh, from Black Hills, I focused specifically on software ever since then, and that was about 2009. So, yeah, and that's the and and by the way, Tim's being a trooper today because he has a he has some pretty nasty gnarly <laughs> allergy issues going on. Yeah. Um, he had to go actually get uh, medication for it. So, um, like he's really sticking. He's he's being a trooper. He's sticking <laughs> kind of like any uh, listeners in the hobbies know how I feel. And they're feeling it right now too, probably. <laughs> yeah, you said the pollen count in uh, South Carolina is pretty bad. Right about yeah, we now. could see it blowing off the trees yesterday. Like you could literally visually see the pollen blowing off the trees. It was nasty. So yeah, when you uh, get that yellowish film on your vehicle, you oh, getting that? It's not a film down here, man. It's like a crust. <laughs> uh, it, it gets gross. thick. Like our whole back porch is green, and once this passes in a couple of weeks, we got to hose everything down and get ready for the summer. Uh, it's a it's a it's a necessary evil we deal with down here. Yeah, I'd be dying. It, I mean, seriously, it's it, it it's bad enough here in Virginia, but South Carolina, whew. in Georgia, yeah, that's pretty bad. In down Georgia, here. yeah, that time of the year gets warmer, but yep. Um, so basically, you know, that's my sort of uh, take on uh, Tim. I mean, honestly, he's been in the industry doing a lot of like visible work for people. He's trained so many people. Uh, which is rewarding in and of itself. Um, and I think, you know, we'll turn it over to you, Tim, just to get a little bit of a background story for those who may not be familiar with you. Like I know, and you know, we had Chris uh, Gates on a couple weeks ago. He was a former army officer. You know, I figured this is a good time to kind of go into your background, talk sure. about your, your origin. Yeah, definitely. Um, 
<clears throat> and it goes way back because uh, you know this is obviously an AppSec podcast, and I, I work specifically in AppSec for a reason. It's because I absolutely love code. I just I love to program. And um, my dad, I think he, man, we had an old IBM XT or something like that. And it was like no hard drive, five and a quarter flop. It was ancient. Uh, four four colors in the monitor type computer, and uh, we had one of those back in the eighties. And I think I started learning how to like boot up. DOS and stuff like that when I was about eight years old. But by the time I was 10 or so, um, I start, I was playing, you know, little, little CGA graphic video games and I wanted to like build a menu so that I didn't have to type in all the commands every time I wanted to put in another disc and then go to launch that game and all that stuff. So I started building little menus out of batch and I would, you know, put them in the auto exec.bat file. So when the computer booted up, it would show this menu and say, hey, if you want to play that game, then enter disk three. And I had them all numbered. And, and my dad was like, what are you doing to my computer, son? And, and I was like, I'm building menus for my games. He said, you really like this stuff, don't you? And, and, I, and I really did. So he introduced me at that point in time to QBasic. And I was doing some simple math and stuff like that. And, and then in the early 90s, a couple of years after that, he introduced me to somebody at work that, that – uh, that did Visual Basic, and I want to say it was like VB4 at the time. Um, and that was my first experience with object-oriented programming. And my dad had me write, I didn't even know it until recently, but he had me write a program that like calculated banding for palettes and stuff. And I, re I didn't know until recently that he actually took that to work, put it into production, and ended up saving a company a bunch of money on excess materials because of a, just a simple program that I, that I had written. And so I always loved to code since I was a kid. Um, but eventually, um, uh, yeah, I didn't, I didn't really take it seriously. I didn't really know what I had there. I just knew that I liked it. Uh, I sucked at sports and wasn't very smart. So when it came time to go to college, I went the army route um, and ended up getting an, an army scholarship. My dad made it very clear he couldn't afford to pay for our colleges. We'd have to do it ourselves, And so I turned to the army for that. Um, and then, you know, went through, but, uh, you know, the army pay for college, they're sending you to work um, when you graduate. And so when I graduated, you know, I had to pick where I was going to go. And I said, well, where are the computers at? They told me the signal corps, so I went in the signal corps. Uh, while I was a signal officer, I spent a bunch of time uh, you know, working on not necessarily computers, but they were, you know, satellite transmission systems and stuff like that. Uh, eventually made my way to the point where I had an opportunity to get into automations. And that's where the Landmaster 53 uh, uh, handle comes from is because um, I was a functional area 53 officer, which was known as the expert of the local area network. And so Landmaster 53 uh, kind of all fit together that way. Um, and when I was doing that is when I had an opportunity to go to uh, do this thing called blue teaming. And when I got to the blue team, I didn't really do, I don't remember doing anything on the blue team, by the way, the army blue team. But as soon as I got there, uh, I interviewed for a spot on the Army Red Team. Um, and I was technical enough to get the job. I was cocky, right? I was cocky. I was like, hey, guys, you know, I'm going to be leading this thing. I'll do all the networking stuff, and you do all the security stuff. And they all kind of chuckled at me, and I didn't really know what they were laughing at, at the time. But, of course, anybody that does security knows that you're, you know, you don't really know your craft until you know how to secure your craft, right, or know how to break your craft. Um, and so... Uh, I, had a, I had an awesome opportunity at that point in time to work with just, I mean, th this was some of the names on the Army Red Team. So Chris Campbell was one of them. That's Obscure Sec. Um, passing the Hash with, I believe his name is Skip Duckwall, was on the team. Manifestation, Matt Graber, PowerShell, uh, or the PowerSploit framework creator was on the team. And then Chris Gates was one of the leaders on the team. Right? Everybody knows Carnal Ownage. And those guys... Those guys were my cyber team. I like I was the leader of those <laughs> four. Like I had to, I, I had to, like I wasn't leading anything, right? They were leading me, but I was in charge of, I was in charge of the deliverable essentially that came out of the team. So these guys were doing amazing work, and we, I didn't even know what they were, who, who, and what they were at the time. Um, but they were doing amazing work, and then I get their reports, and I'm reading through these reports and seeing all these amazing things that these guys are doing, and I started taking that home, building labs, and started doing that stuff. Um, and really credit to those four guys, and there were a few others as well, but to those four guys, probably don't even know, may not even know to this day, they taught me almost everything I knew for the first five years of, of my career, just reading their stuff. And as a matter of fact, if anybody's listening, wants to know how you can learn more, read deliverables. If you have the opportunity to read deliverables in your own company or as a third-party consultant, read them. I've told this to project managers. I've told this to um, salespeople, if you want to learn kind of the lingo and understand what we're doing, read deliverables. And 
one of the really cool things about nowadays is we have a type of deliverable that we never had growing up in InfoSec, and that's in bug bounty programs and bug bounty write-ups. So there are deliverables at your disposal in the in the in the form of bug bounty write-ups that you can go and read. And to me, those sometimes quite often are much more creative because they're not just finding issues, they are trying to find and make them seem as most severe as possible <laughs> and prove them to be the most severe as possible so that they can get the biggest payout. So they go through all kinds of different things to make the to make a maximum impact, which is which is really fun to read some of the things that people come up with. So I learned a ton from reading those guys, and then that led into working for um, a big consulting firm when I first got out, which was probably one of the most miserable professional four years in my life, and then went and joined John John Strand at Black Hills, which was an absolutely amazing experience, and I owe a ton of my career to John. He's been awesome for me every step of the way, John Strand, that is. Um, and then you approached me while I was at Black Hills, and I was like, Tim, how would you like to come do software security? And I was like, that's all I want to do. And John was like, I'm not going to let you just do that. So if that's all you want to do, then go do it, man, and and be happy. And so I did. I took that leap and been doing software security ever since. And you kind of picked it up from there. Uh, yeah, yeah, I love it. Love it. Love code, man. I've never done it professionally, though. And that's the interesting thing. People will say, well, if you love code so much, why have you never done it professionally? I'm afraid that if I do it professionally, I'll fall out of love with it. I think work tends to do that to things sometimes when you make it a job, all of a sudden you don't enjoy it as much. And so I keep coding to myself. I, I, I'm not going to ever do that for money simply because I enjoy it so much and I don't want to ruin that. We've actually, we've gotten similar, you know, like, Oh, you, you know, you could do the X, Y, Z. And, and we've had a couple of people purchase to do like uh, sponsorships or, you know, sponsored this and that. And we haven't done it just because it's like, this is supposed to be for fun. It's a similar mindset. Like it's supposed to be for fun. And sometimes you're right. Like when you get paid for it, it changes the dynamic a bit mentally. Um, but I, I think that, you know, it's interesting that you got to start with some of the people that you got to, uh, to start with, like, that's a good crew to, to, to really launch your knowledge base from. It was an incredible then, blessing. And a lot of those guys were getting started at the same time. I think Chris, uh, Chris Campbell and Matt, both of those guys, um, I think the Army Red Team was one of their first their first exposures to really getting into security as a professional, um, you know. And that was, I mean, it's, it was a huge launching point. I think maybe even Chris Gates launched his career from that that part as well. But it was just, it was real blessing to to be able to have those guys influence on me early in my career. Um, definitely helping Chris obviously taught me the importance of personal brand and marketing yourself and writing blog posts and all of that. And so huge credit to him for. Uh, for a lot of mentorship in that area as well. Yeah, Chris is, um, he, he's always kind of approached mentorship with like, as far as you'll go, I'll, I'll go with you. But, you know, he definitely requires like, uh, I think most good mentors require um, you to, you to really um, follow to the letter what, you know, might seem tedious or difficult at times, but you know, it's, there's a reason behind it. So. Well, I'll tell you, it was um, funny. Like we didn't always get along well. Because okay. uh, if people that don't know Chris, and, and I'm sure he won't mind me sharing this, you know, he was a captain in the army as well who got out of the army to do the red team thing. So he was a civilian when me, a captain in the army, got to step in and do what he wanted to do when he was in. Um, and so there was this sense of who is this guy? <laughs> like he's getting to do exactly what I want to do, but he is so much less with regard to technical prowess, right? And so now I've got to not only not only do I am I not getting to do this in uniform. Now I'm working for somebody in uniform, having to do it. And he technically didn't work for me, but I led the team, right? Led the team. Um, and so we didn't always get along as well. He made it very clear. He goes, man, you ask me a question, you ask it once. But I'm going to answer it once. And then you better remember it. You better commit it to memory, write it down, take notes. Um, but it was it was funny. So early on, it was, it was there was a little bit of a, you know, like, and yeah. then I just said, look, Chris, man, I want to learn from you, dude. You're, I, I look up to you. You're awesome. You... I want to learn from you and be a student of your work. And from that point on, man, we've had a great relationship ever since. Yeah. And I think both you and him have grown uh, personally as well too. So, you know, people, that's what happens. Oh, yeah. We'll get a little bit older. We get a little bit less, uh, we cranky and a little bit more, uh, hopefully anyways, not everyone, but hopefully. priorities change too, right? Priorities change and life, life happens. So for sure.
Yeah. So switching gears for, you know, in terms of why, why recon NG, you know, what was the driving purpose behind building recon G? What's the sort of, um, benefit to folks, you know, like how would that apply to them doing, uh, you know, penetration testing and, um, what's its current status? So sure. I'm sorry, that's a bunch of all at once, but let's, no, let's fine. Why, why, why did you, why'd you build it? So it was never meant to be like, I, I think I, early on, I tried to sell it as a one-stop shop for, for reconnaissance, but, but, you know, very quickly I, I realized it, it was, it, it can't be meant to be a one-stop shop for reconnaissance. But what I set out to do was demonstrate that because um, what I saw both in network systems pen testing and in application security um, pen testing was OSINT was that part of the methodology that people tended to skimp on. Like if you need, because our biggest restriction is what's time, right? And so if you're going to cut back somewhere, OSINT typically was the thing that got cut back because it has the least perceived value. You may find some really good stuff. You also might not, right? And so when you look at risk versus reward, a lot of folks say, well, I don't want to risk spending a whole day doing an OSINT and walk away with nothing when I know I could jump into my other pieces of my methodology and begin the process of finding vulnerabilities. So people were just kind of leaving it out. So my goal with Recon NG was to say, you know, let's not skip it. Let's just make it more efficient, right? Let's be smarter about how we do it. And so automate the harvesting a lot of, of a lot of the resources and information that could be harvested. I mean, there's always going to be some manual intelligence that has to be collected, but I wanted to do the best we could to automate the stuff that could be automated. And it started off as a script. And then I also, I mean, it's probably been the single biggest learning experience um, of my life. So when I started writing it, what, in like 2013 or 2014 until today, I've probably rewritten it five or six times because I get smarter. I learn a little bit more. I go back a year later. I'm like, oh, this is hideous. I got to rewrite it, right? So I go back to work and I rewrite components of it. I make it a little bit more modular and it's just, it's grown because I've used it as a tool to learn. Um, and so that's kind of how it's gotten that. I mean, that's kind of how I would expect people to use it. One of the downsides to it is years have gone on. A lot of the resources where we harvest information have locked their doors yeah. right they've shut their doors and they've locked them they put them behind paywalls and there's still we can still get at some information but there's some things we just flat can't get at anymore um and that's unfortunate but it is the nature of of the beast and so uh, i would hope that it's still useful to folks um I, I imagine it is i still get a lot of traffic on it a lot of questions a lot of a lot of uh issues and bugs being reported and getting fixed uh, to the issue tracker on the repositories. And so I think it's still heavy in use. And, and as a result of that, very recently, I went through another rebuild for version five. Right now we're somewhere in version four, but I'm working on version five now. And basically what I'm doing there is I wanted to decouple modules from the core framework for a couple different reasons. Number one, because main, you know, modules are community contributed. And there's a ton of work in maintaining other people's code, and I need help with that. Um, but at this, but I don't want to give the people that are helping fix modules and maintain modules the keys to the kingdom in, in terms of also modifying the core of the framework. And so I wanted to decouple those two for that reason. Another reason that I wanted to decouple it um, was because I want people to be able to reuse the core, right? They, they can take the core, look at the functionality and say, wow, I could build a wireless attack framework around this in Python, or I could build some other type of network exploitation uh, framework in Python around this thing, or whatever they want to do with it. So the core will be more usable from that perspective. Um, and, and then the thirdly, I just wanted to do it, right? I just wanted to see what it was like to build something that, that you, you imported things from other locations and go through that whole process. And doing that on the command line is different. I don't know that I've ever worked with um, a tool that was command line only that had like a marketplace for for extensions. And so building that for the command line interface was really fun. And so I've got that, that actually, that component is actually done. The other big thing that I'm doing for version five is converting to Python three, because we know Python two is, is on its way out. Um, Python three is gonna be it going forward. And so that's, that's a big task there, converting everything over to Python three. Um, once those two major components are done, then I'll be ready to push out version five. And I'm going to be looking for lots of testers because everything in it has changed. 
and I need people to find broken stuff because <laughs> my little testing and my test scripts probably aren't going to find every possible wrong. And no, I didn't write unit tests, Seth. So <laughs> yeah, that, was, that was my next question, right? Well, I knew you know, it was going. unit tests, man. I knew it. I was thinking, I've considered going back and writing unit tests, um, which is the wrong way to do it, right? You should do it as you're developing, but uh, I didn't. That, that, so. That's okay. It's just like every other like project that I open up and I look in the test directory and it's the stub, right? That's it. So. Yeah, that's it. That's it. So I don't know. We'll see. We'll see if I ended up doing that there. Uh, resource scripts are do a pretty good job of, of testing the framework as well. So, but, so yeah, I, that's I, I did have a question around that because I like I've seen, you know, Jason Haddix and all of his like bug bounty hunters methodology. And there's a lot of OSN in stuff that's in that. I've wondered if like you've looked at that and what he's doing there, like the sources that he's pulling in. Um, the tools that he's running as opposed to what we've got in Recon NG or what you have in Recon NG. Has that been on your radar? Yeah. No, I mean, I would say on my radar, I'm aware of it, but I've not dug into it at all. Um, and bug hunting, the bug hunting and methodology and the different steps of it, and the tools and the approaches, I've not spent a whole lot of time in that area. Um, and I think it is, I would imagine it's significantly different than standard pen, te pen testing because you're essentially in a race, right? A lot of time you're racing other testers to the things that are going to get paid. So um, with that in mind, I think the methodology is probably very different than the slow, methodical, step-by-step -step approach that we take when we actually conduct a full test. So um, I've not actually dug into that. I focus more on the other areas of it. But I do have a lot of folks that use Recon NG as a part of their of their uh, bug hunting methodology. And those folks do end up recommending or requesting or actually contributing a lot of those modules that they've written personally to yeah. help their bug hunting process. And so I think when you when you see the marketplace go live, the number of modules that are available is going to grow because I have pushed a lot down. I've pushed a lot back because I'm like, well, I don't want all these extra dependencies in, in the framework or I just don't like the way your code looks. Like, there's a lot of reasons why I've pushed back on some of these things. Having that open marketplace will now be like, it's going to be like everybody, you contribute, right? If you if you want your module to be seen, shoot it over here. We'll run it through some quality checks and then we'll bring it in and make it available to folks. And and I'll have a team of people helping me do that. So I think we'll see a lot more of that in there once we move to the marketplace. Cool, cool. Yeah, I mean, I figured there was, there, there is quite a bit of overlap, right? You know, just looking in Haddix's methodology and some of the so sources that he's pulling in. The one thing that I did like is he's got, I mean, he's, he's dropped out stuff that isn't as efficient or whatever it is. Right. And I, sure. I think there's, there's some gains there. If people are submitting modules, I'm sure it's very similar to what he's doing as well. So and well, I'll be interested I, to I mean, see once it pops up. So. Yeah. One of my other hopes for recon and G was that people would start to walk away from some of these one-off scripts and write modules to do that within Recon NG so that we wouldn't have to have all these one-off scripts used for, you know, I'm going to harvest this source. I use this script to harvest that one and this script to harvest that one. Let's just put it all in one place yeah. so that we don't have to do that. Uh, I know there's a lot of folks who still use the harvester alongside Recon NG, alongside Tool X, alongside Tool Y. Uh, I'd like to see a, a consolidation there as well and then welcome the developers of those scripts, those tools to come join of the team at Recon NG and help build out some of that stuff. Um, that way we don't have to manage so many different resources. But if it can be scripted, then Recon NG can do it. They can have a module for it and do the same thing. So yeah. it'd be nice to see us move in that direction too. I had a question also. Sure. Um, have you thought about moving to a professional uh, code repository hosting site? We did. Oh, that's the other big change that I didn't actually mention. There's a third one. I'm like, I forget I'm what just it is. I'm just yeah. messing with you. So, so it's already there. Version five is already being developed on GitHub. Oh, nice. Oh, nice. Yeah. Wait, so, I, I got to find a different link then. Jeez. So it will, the, the, the module, the module marketplace is also on GitHub. The main repository version five has already been moved over there. When we, uh, when we upgrade, when we push out the, uh, uh, the tag for version five, the Bitbucket version is going to forward people over to get GitHub. Now it's going to break a lot of stuff, All right, There's going to be, you know, uh, Kali and some other, uh, pen testing framework, uh, or Linux instances are probably going to break. They're going to have to update the repositories 
to point in the other place, uh, but we'll figure that out when we get there. And a lot of people are going to go to log into Recon NG that haven't done it in a couple of months. They're going to be like, why is nothing working? <laughs> because it's broken. And, so. and I just want to say for the record, this has been a long running joke between Tim and I, so it's I don't yeah. mean it with any seriousness. I didn't, that is very interesting. Uh, yeah. But yeah, like it, it started on, it started on Bitbucket because Bitbucket was the only one that offered uh, free private um, repos. And so I've got a lot of stuff there because they're the only ones that that allowed free private. But now that GitHub's, GitHub has opened that door, now I'm moving stuff over because I do prefer GitHub's interface. Yeah, I actually think now we did talk about this. Yeah, you, yeah. you actually did mention yeah. that. Yeah, sorry. So that's I'm the reason why that's the reason why I started there. I have a developer that, that that's helping with the modules, and and he refused to create a Bitbucket account, and and so that's that's why the new version is already on GitHub because he flat out refused to create a Bitbucket account to help me. <laughs> <laughs> that's hilarious. So so that's... hopefully hopefully the you know it doesn't work the other way around now that I'm over on GitHub. People are like, no, I'm not creating a GitHub account. So. Oh yeah, okay, it's it's it's, it's, by it's Microsoft. Microsoft. It's the yeah. board. It's fine, you know. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I've heard I've heard that one. I've heard when they when they were announcing announcing the uh, yeah the whole Microsoft acquisitions. People were like, oh, I'm moving off of it. Yeah, I can't keep track of who owns who. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's a good point. Actually, about what you were saying too about how the tool has run into issues with like. Um, hitting paywalls where, you know, like services have, you know, quote unquote, maybe, I don't want to say grown up, but they, they've definitely monetized or been acquired and now monetized. And um, that's just like such a frequent model, you know, where it's like, it starts off with something, it's valuable, it's free, freemium. And then yeah. now it's, you're hitting these, uh, these situations. And, and Google's, uh, Google's, um, Google's capture system is strong. Like I, I, and I was able, I successfully a few years ago was able to find a way to answer the CAPTCHA within Recon NG and continue the process of harvesting uh, and using Google results. I can't do that anymore. It just, I mean, I have gone, I have revisited several times. I cannot find a way to do it. I've even gone as far as trying to write plugins for Recon NG that will allow you to add an API key for a CAPTCHA answering service. And then just farm the captures out to the capture app capture answer capture answering service as they come in, um, but Google's even made I mean they've made that really hard to do. So um, yeah, it's huh. right now I've given up on that for the moment and and I'm focusing on version five. But yeah, things are just harder to get at. Yeah, interesting. No, I it's a little bit easier to target. What's that? Bing is a little bit of an easier target with that regard. They're a little bit more um. with their information, but um, yeah, Google's really tough to get any information out of. Interesting. Interesting. Yeah, I know that's so, always like when I've used it. The, the whole pop up from like the Google Captcha that like once it starts, it's like oh crap, here we go, right? You know, make sure that, yeah. that you can actually pull that information back. So yeah, I thought you could just give it an because that's what I was like uh, years ago that you could just give it. Um, you'd sign up for a Google API key and you could do like a certain thousands of requests. A, yep. uh, that yeah, was the old school SOAP API. The new, the new API, the, the only thing you have access to is the custom search, en search engine. And it's really restricted. Like you have to go in and pre-configure like domains that it will return responses from and stuff. And it's really inefficient. It just doesn't work well. They, they, I, mean, it, that's their, I mean, that's their, that's their intellectual property, right? Their search results are, are, are a big part of their business. And so if people can just harvest their search results, then they could just create a new interface with Google's on the back end, and they don't want that. Right? That's absolutely not what they want to provide people. So um, they don't want to give that away. And I don't blame them. Just like LinkedIn doesn't want to give away their information, and Salesforce doesn't want to give away their information. They, they've all become really hard targets to get data from, where in the past, you used to be able to get tons of data out of them. So, I mean, are you using the Google API for like Google hacking, Google kind I've of? Got, like... I, I've got some Google API modules in there, but mm -hmm. like I said, the API doesn't give you nearly as much as the web interface. So ah. um, I still have the web interface thing in there, but when you hit the CAPTCHA, yeah, you're not getting anything else. So, ah, I see. Makes at sense. least not until it resets. Nice. Um, so there was like, I think now would be a great time to pivot into the, the, the burp conversation sure. because so backing up, um, I, I've been using, when I say using burp to 2.0, it's been like probably what a lot of people are using. You know what I mean? It's like, it's available sure. and you download it and it, and you try to use it the way that you would use the, the version 1.x 
and you know at least the things you're familiar with like intruder repeater things like that mm -hmm. um but then you know like there are definitely points and 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 specifically i noticed the scanning is the the big one that i run into pretty frequently that's feels completely different i'm in unfamiliar territory probably a lot of people are yep. and you've done a lot of homework and research on all right here's what you're used to with one x let's talk about two x let's talk about what's different uh what advantages you have how you can apply it to pen testing um and just sure. overall what's changed so yeah if you could give people like kind of a um kind of like a uh, uh some some intro into that uh that'd be great yeah so when they announced it last august and then released it i think in late august just just prior to september um you know i'm, I'm in the midst of teaching pwapt and and one of the things that i you know one of the things I don't want, I don't like the idea of doing is bringing people into a classroom that are paying to be there and walk away with a, with a, with a skill set and value um, is to teach them something that may be obsolete in two months or even six months. Yeah. Right. I'm just not a fan of that. And so I made the decision immediately and I, was I talked to Defeat directly and was like, look, I'm going to do this. I'm going to start exclusively teaching 2.0. Um, and, you know, I will, as I run into bugs, I'll let you know, as, as people have questions, I'll let you know. And, and we've, we've started a really good dialogue that continues today between myself and their support team where they answer questions. And, and I, I ask questions, they answer questions, it clarifies things. I put them up on a Google doc and we can share that link out if you have show notes or something like that, but it's also on my blog um, that I've been, I've been publicizing those results. Uh, I sanitize some of the some information that may come back and forth. But for the most part, all that information is out there. Um, but I just made the decision that I wasn't going to teach the old version. Uh, and, and since I'm teaching the new version, well, I've got to be a subject matter expert on it, right? So I also d started diving into it really deeply to see kind of where the differences were um, and you know, uh, what new things and how to expect it, where are the gotchas. I mean, just a lot of different aspects of it. and and. Uh, and as you guys know, once you once you start to teach something, you you have no choice but to come to the subject matter expert pretty quickly. And so that's kind of what happened there. Um, happy to tell you though, Ken, that uh, everything you did before is still there. Nice. Right? That every 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 way you did is specifically the scanner. Uh, let me let me take that back. There's one piece that's different, but for the most part, everything you did, the, the way that you scanned before is all still there. How you get to it looks differently, um, and the and it's a little bit more broken apart. You know how you started a scanner wizard and it kind of walked you through the different pieces of the scan and then at the end you hit go and it scanned, right? right. Well, all of that functionality is still there. Every step in that wizard process is still there, but it's no longer a flow. You have to just go here and configure a piece of it, then go here and configure another piece, and then go to another place, configure another piece, but you can still do all the same stuff that you did before. By and large, what I think, and this is complete conjecture here, this is not factor, and Portswigger has not said it to me at all, is Portswigger wanted to compete on a larger market, right? There's you know, IBM AppScan, Acunetics, NetSparker, all these other organizations that are have these, these big enterprise level scanners um, that are doing their thing and for a hefty price tag, and, and Burp does what they do, what well, I consider pretty darn well, and they wanted to get into that game because they deserve a piece of that space, right? They've got a really good scanning engine that's got probably some of the best signatures. They, If they don't, if James Kettle and his crew isn't creating and finding the next vulnerability, they're implementing it into the scanner before anybody else is. So that logic, that logic, the scanner logic deserved a, a larger platform. And so they're building out this enterprise, right? This enterprise I, scanner, go ahead. I think it's important to note real quick too, that people were shoehorning in their own little solutions. Like it was a, for a long time, it, this was something people were trying to do anyways themselves yeah. using either yeah. like a combination yeah. of like code automation or you know, obviously code on sorry, like uh, scripting, but also maybe using like the, uh, the, the API, sorry, right. like the API, that, right. the command line switches and stuff like that to try to automate some of that. Yep. Exactly. Um, and so, and so, you know, they, they naturally, they want to build this enterprise product, but the thing is, is they don't have anyone to test the enterprise product, but what do they have? They've got thousands upon thousands of users of the Burt Pro suite. And so what you what you have seen is the technology that's going to make up the enterprise scanner is a is what they have brought into 
Burp Pro so that now all of these thousands of users of Burp Pro have become beta testers of what's going to, what's going to make up the enterprise technology. Yeah. Um, and so that's what you've seen there. And a lot of people got intimidated by that because the interface is different. And now there's new options, right? It's no longer called spider. It's called crawl. It's no longer called scanning. It's called auditing. Um, and it's orange, right? There's orange in it. Oh, my gosh, there's a new color added to the interface. And so it just changes things. And it can be a little intimidating. I get it because Burp in itself is a large tool with a lot of components. And folks that didn't already feel like they had a good handle on it, now what they thought they did have a handle on it looks different. And so it can be intimidating. But all of it's still there. Um, the biggest thing right now, and, and I, I, I don't know this for sure, but I believe the reason why it's still not gone to production, one of the main reasons why it's not gone to production is the crawler. Uh, one of the biggest issues that I have um, both in teaching it and in using it, because I'm using it also at, in my day-to-day -day consulting, um, is that the crawler right now does not find anything in JavaScript. Zero, right? The, the old school spider had regular expressions that it would search JavaScript for and pull out relative and absolute URLs. Mm -hmm. um, the, uh, oh, my phone was ringing. The, the new crawler doesn't do that. Now, they have a plan for that, right? They're building a more human-like interface that wants to navigate the GUI, right? Click the links and exercise all of the functionality and events so that it does trigger all of these JavaScript URLs. Um, but the crawler right now doesn't have that. And they've also removed the regular expressions from the new crawler. So as of right now, like the target application Pwn Hub that we use uh, um, in PWAPT, it's probably 80% JavaScript embedded links and URLs. Um, it's, it replicates a modern web application where most of that stuff is being dynamically created. And guess what? It finds almost, I mean, it finds a fraction of that application when you crawl it. So the biggest thing, my biggest recommendation is if you're going to use the new burp in day-to-day -day activities, do man you have to man manually map. Because if you if you rely on automated crawling, you're only gonna it's not gonna find hardly anything. You need to manually map the application. Now that changes how you use the new scanner because if you have three different options when you go to the scanner, you have a crawl and audit, you've got to audit selected items, and then you have a crawl option. Right, the crawl option is just like Spider. All it does is crawl and try to fill up your site map. But those other two are very different. Crawl and audit is the new thing. That's the enterprise. That's the enterprise answer. That's the set it, forget it, walk away scanner. It will crawl the application using its crawler and then only scans the thing that it finds when it crawls. So it doesn't matter what's in your site map. If you do a crawl and audit, it only scans what it finds, which in most cases is going to be very little. The second option, the scan, scan uh, or audit selected items, that's the old school scanner. That's what we all used before. Because if you click on that, you'll notice in the, in the interface, you now have, it now populates everything from your site map. You go to consolidate items and you see that familiar wizard where you get to go in and select all the endpoints it's going to scan or not scan and so on and so forth. Oh, so that's, that's the actual new way to get to the old way we all used to use the scanner, where you manually map it first, and then you go in and you launch a scan against everything that you found, okay? Um, so that's, that's the right way. Now, now, there's advantages and disadvantages to each of those, because the new crawl and audit, or the new crawler, it solves the problem of cross-site request forgery and session management, because you give it credentials, and it will log itself in, Right. It actually the way that it works is it starts at the root of what you give it and it navigates to every single endpoint it discovers. So you start from an unauthenticated root URL. It finds a resource and it goes there. If it finds a resource three layers deep, it doesn't just go straight to that resource. It starts at point A again, goes to the login page, authenticates with the credentials you give it and then moves on to that resource. And it starts over and does that process for everything that it finds. And so because it's doing that, it's getting that CSRF token on the subsequent request and it's able to go through there. If it logs itself out, guess what? On the next on the next thread, it's going to log itself back in on its way to the resource. So it answers those questions, which is, I mean, I think it's gonna be great when the crawler's done. I think it's gonna be a really, really good tool. Uh, but right now the crawler's not finding any JavaScript, so we can't use that. And if you go back to that scan, or audit selected items, the old school scanning perspective, well, you're doing it the old way again, 
right? You got to give it a session that's authenticated. You got to babysit it to make sure it doesn't log itself out, right? There's all the same things you had to do with Burp version one to uh, to watch over that particular scan. And so um, I would say anybody that's going in and using it for the new time, that's really, you're right, the scanner's the big difference. And those are the two things that you need to watch out for. There's a couple of gotchas in there as well if you want me to cover them. Yeah, um, no, I would love yeah. to have that covered. Yeah, let, let me actually pull up pull up some of my notes here that I've got here um, because these gotchas uh, can certainly trick you. When you go in and you configure the scan, um, you're able to you know very much like when you went to the scanner tab and you went to options and you got to set different things like oh treat this as an injection point all that stuff. Well, now that's done via a scan configuration, and when you open up a scan configuration page, you're given these 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 groups of panels. And so you expand the panel, you set some configurations, and then you 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 you, you, you uh, complete, uh, what's it called when you well you put the panel back up, right? You go to the next panel, you make some changes, and you put the panel back up. If you don't leave the panel open, the configurations you make there don't apply, and people will miss that. When I show folks that in in class, they're like, "Are you kidding me? That doesn't make any sense." And it doesn't make any sense, um, but they're not going to change it. All right, I can tell you that. So if you go through each, if you go through each panel and you make changes to the configuration, and the only one you have open at the end is the bottom one, those are the only configurations that are getting applied there. Um, okay. and so that's you that's, basically don't minimize. That's what you're saying. Don't minimize the panes when you're going through scan configuration. And they did add a little visual cue, like when you zip it back up, it says not configured in small print over to the right. But most people don't pay attention to that. They're just moving no. on to the next pane. So you definitely want to leave those panels open as you're configuring it, which means you're going to be doing some scrolling there to get to some of the bottom level options. But um, that's that's certainly I got you there. Um, let me go through here and look again. Yeah, and you know that's been. I think that that's really like. I think the the biggest because I let me just preface what I'm about to say sure. with I love burp. I've been using burp for a long time. Um, like if there's anybody who's a fan of burp, definitely have always considered myself um, a fan of it. Uh, but that doesn't mean it's not without its faults. So it's the memory leaks uh, where it consumes a lot of memory. Um, that's always been an issue. And uh, they're, they're in the last few years have been like pretty consistent updates pretty frequently. Um, and then I think the other thing would be the UI that you mentioned where there's some gotchas and some, some, you know, some weird UI UX behavior that is a little um, less than ideal for folks. But overall, again, I think pointing back to what you said about having an amazing scanning signature, um, I think it's got so many useful features in it. Um, you know, good API, uh, good extensions. Uh, that marketplace has grown, so there are a lot of uh, pros. Oh yeah, cons, I mean, but I, the, yeah, I had the discussion with folks a lot. What it comes down to is there's nothing better right now, and to me, and to me, there's nothing that even really comes close right now. But it absolutely has its faults. I mean, it's kind of like it's kind of like I wouldn't sit here and say Recon NG is a perfect tool, right? I mean, it's it's got yeah. its problems, and then there's things that are a certain way because I like them that way. <laughs> you know, not because yeah. not because they're best for you, but because I like doing it that way. And so now I'm sure there's a bit of that and there's a bit of that in, in Burp as well. Um, but one of the other gotchas I wanted to mention was that um, if you run subsequent scans against the same application within the same uh, within the same project, it will look like it's, it will not report those findings again. So you could you you could report you could run a scan and find a whole bunch of stuff, run that scan immediately again and it say I found nothing. Oh. And it's and that can re, that can be really misleading because then you're like, oh my gosh, what broke? Something happened. Something's wrong. Did the app happen? Do I not have access anymore? Did this? And it can you can cause you to kind of begin to wonder about the stability of the tool and the stability of the application. But if you open up the actual task that you just started with that particular scan and look at it, you'll see that it did actually find those things again. It just doesn't report them again. Um, that can be misleading. Um, and probably the other one that's bugging me the most, and they're they're probably not going to change its behavior. And I understand, and I understand why is when you go through and you do the scan um, selected items. Uh, remember, you know, like the old school way where you would go through and you have to consolidate all the your entire site map. You'd have to consolidate it down to only the stuff that you want to scan. Um, well, in, within those options, there's a checkbox that says remove uh, remove endpoints with no injection points. 
Yeah. Okay. Or, I'm sorry. It says remove endpoints with no parameters. Yes. Yeah. Well, if you're dealing with an MVC application or a RESTful web service where the parameters are embedded inside the URL, guess what that checkbox doesn't see as a parameter? The URL. Yeah. So yeah. like if you like my application that we use, the Pwn Hub application is MVC. Most of the parameters, most of the injection points are inside the URL and are seen as directory tokens by a URL parser, right? And so when you go and you check that box, I, there's like four requests that you can fuzz inside the target application. But the reality is, is a lot of folks don't realize that when they look at their application, they're like, of course, I don't want to uh, I don't want to scan anything where where the parameters are missing. And they may not notice what actually happened, because even with phonehome.com, yeah, it only leaves four requests left that I can I can see clearly. I'm missing a huge chunk of this application, but it's a small app in a huge app where even if you remove the MVC style URLs, there's still a ton of resources. You may not notice what you just did. And so I've had a lot of students that realized, oh my gosh, I've been missing the majority of the applications I've been scanning because I've been checking that box and removing all of my MVC style URLs from the scanner. Um, and that's important. That's a huge one as well. That's a big time gotcha. And I talked to him and I said, well, why, why don't you treat these URL tokens as parameters? And because there's a configuration where you can check a box that says treat directory tokens as parameters or as injection points. And he said, because they're not parameters, they're injection points. And the box clearly says parameters. According to the URI specification, they are not parameters. And I was like, okay, I got you. I mean, I, I agree, right? They're not parameters by the letter of the law, but how about giving us another checkbox that says, you know, remove all requests that don't have injectable or injection points or something. So, or change the verbiage, but. I think they may do that. Like they, I, after we went back and forth a few times on that, and they started to understand kind of where I was coming from there. But uh, we'll see. But that's definitely something you want to keep in mind when you're using the scanner. Cool. As far as the other functionality within Verb, no, I mean, you could probably tell nothing's changed, right? Um, yeah. If what you yeah. walk away with anything, I just say be careful using the crawler right now because it's not doing what you think it's doing. Yeah, and that that actually I mean, it makes a lot of sense. Like I. I, I I did an evaluation of like Burp Enterprise, like the Enterprise Edition, mm -hmm. right? Like a thirty day, and I was like, man, it's just not finding anything, right? Yep. Um, and it, but I, now that I think about it, it, was modern applications, right? It was all JavaScript, so it, it makes sense that it didn't find anything if that's how the crawler's been, you know, changed at this point, right? If it's not the the old spider, um, so we'll just have to wait and give them a chance later on once they actually get that fixed, because maybe that'll. Bump, bump them up the list. So yeah, so all these all these little gotchas that I mentioned, and then there's a lot more. Uh, I ask a lot of questions, and they've clarified a lot of things over the past uh, six seven months. All of it's in a document, a Google Doc. And if you go to landmaster53.com and then go to the projects page, just scroll down to where you see Burp version 2.0 FAQ, and that'll take you to the Google Doc that's got all that data in it. Um, there's some highlights in it right now because I highlighted some things for the class. I see a bunch of people popping in. Um, but uh, that's the doc. Um, bookmark and revisit a day question so that you can see when that, when that answer's been updated. Um, when you come back, you'll be able to kind of see if there's any new information there. But as I continue to teach classes, I walk away with new questions, new bugs, new feature requests. I ask the question, they answer, and just trying to become that conduit for this type of information so that they don't end up getting bombarded with the same question over and over and over again, try to get this information out. Um, become a one stop, kind of like a one 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 place where, where people can get that information rather than having to go to Port Swigger for it. So yeah. No, it's been helpful. And I, I did link both the doc and your site cool. on, the, on the show notes awesome. and in the, in the Slack channel. So um, if pe as people ask, have questions, I'm sure they'll they'll hit you up. I think you're pretty easy to find online. So. Yeah. And I'm pretty responsive too. Like I I'm definitely approachable. Yeah. Yep. Um Cool. Uh, I, like, how have you found the responsiveness that, then of, you know, Port Swigger? I, I mean, I, it sounds like you guys are pretty, you know, tight as far as like actually dealing with him on it. So, well, I'm a, I'm, I'm a, I'm a Port Swigger preferred trainer. So if you go to the Port Swigger's website, you'll see me listed on there as, as a trainer. And so that I noticed I mean, that I don't know that, yeah. that I don't know that that gives me any special treatment, but. Um, I, I definitely use that to to reach out and talk to the feed uh, over the years. And and I would say starting at Black Hat many, many years ago when I, I approached him one day and just kind of talked to him. I was teaching another web, web app set class there. Um, 
he's just been pretty good about that. Now I did go like about a month and a half without a response. And it was kind of like, well, I guess they've gotten enough. I guess they've had enough of me. Right. <laughs> but then they came back and responded eventually. So I know they're super busy, right? I get it. I'm, you know, I'm doing consulting and, and I got open source and I have people asking questions and stuff. And so I get the delay there. I don't hold it against them. They've been pretty darn responsive. And I think one of the reasons they are responsive is because I'm sharing the information and they're not having to give it to a bunch of people. They can just yeah. give it to one. And so um, I'd like to continue to try to do that for them and, uh, and for the tool just to get the knowledge out for the users. Nice. Yeah. Cool. Uh, sorry, I, I was about to. I, I it sounded like you were about to. Uh, like, try not to interrupt you. <laughs> no, it's good. I was just snorting. <laughs> it's a professional podcast. Don't worry yes, about it. <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> Sweet. So, what's next then, Tim? What's what? What's on your plate? What? Uh, I mean, I know you guys. You you got the training stuff that you're doing. You know. Yeah. You know. Go ahead and like. Sure. Pitch where you're going to be next, uh, you know, because I know people are interested and like I always get questions. I, I know you don't come out West Coast that often. We got to figure out a way to make that happen. I mean, I don't not come because I don't want to. Yeah, I, uh, I typically go where I'm invited or where there's uh, where there's a, a an expressed interest. Um, I am going to be out in California later on this year, but it's for a private onsite class. So. Uh, maybe that'll maybe that'll drum up a little bit with the organization to work with, get their people out in the open talking about it. But it's definitely not because I don't want to. I'd love to come out. I'd love to come out west. Um, so right now I've got classes. I got one next week in Atlanta. Um, I was really surprised that it's, it's really interesting how I'll go to big cities like that and have a low attendance, and then I'll go in the middle of nowhere, Wisconsin, and sell out. I have no idea why that happens. It's the weirdest thing, but uh, I've got still got plenty of open seats for Atlanta next week. If there's some late registrants that want to get involved there, I'll be in Boston and in Minneapolis in June. And then I'll be in Springfield, Missouri in, I believe, late July, if I'm not mistaken. Um, but uh, but yeah, I, I've noticed that my uh, my private on-site classes are actually picking up and the the registration for the public classes is slowing down a little bit probably a little bit of saturation a little bit of laziness on my part with not marketing well either but um i'm just going i'm just you know where people where people want it i typically go there how that happens is if folks are interested whether it's a company or an individual or an organization like isac or a wasp or somebody like that i will partner with those organizations find a facility host a class give some free seats away to folks that help me do that um, and we put the class together that way. Um, one of my big efforts this year is working on P PBAT, which is Practical Burp Suite Advanced Tactics. Um, I halted development on that until it gets picked up somewhere. I've got the CFP into Derby or CFT into DerbyCon for PBAT. Um, if they pick it up, then I will continue development on that and finish that. Um, but there's a couple of places where it got turned down this year. And so I, until it gets picked up, I don't want to invest all the additional time it's going to take to finish that class up. But it's going to be awesome. It's going to be burp all the time and we're going to do things like set up a collaborator server and write our own extension and we're going to use the macros and we're going to play with click bandit and we're going to do um, all the stuff people either haven't heard of or don't mess with because it's it looks hard we're going to do those things in that particular class and we're going to cover just a lot of the quality of life tips and tricks that i use we'll cover the scanner stuff that we talked about here in more detail and actually go through and do those things um, it's growing. Like I wanted it to be a two day class. It may end up being larger once I get done with it, but there's going to, it's going to be really fun. There's going to be a lot of good stuff in there, but it's not going to be aspect specific. I'm not talking about vulnerabilities. We're talking yeah. about BART, hundred yeah. so. <laughs> percent. Well, no, that, I, I mean, th that's the thing is I feel like we've got, I, I mean, there's a lot of kind of like web app one, or what about hacking one oh one classes that you see? Uh, you know what I mean? You know, definitely. We recommend yours, you know, for sure. You know, the way, the way that you teach and things like that is very approachable and it makes it a lot easier to learn. It just feels like we don't concentrate as much on like the tooling. Like that's part of the, the reason we started doing code review stuff is we don't talk a lot about the, the process around things. It's more, hey, what's the cool exploit that you can do? Can you go do SQL injection? Yay, yeah. you can, right? But like that doesn't really teach you how to get in and do that over and over and the nuances and everything else that's 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 related to it. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm happy to hear that there is something that is going to be burp specific because that was always a, a hard thing when I was getting in and when I was doing the, like my transfer from 
you know, web scare of burp, right? You know, back in the day, it was like, uh, okay, I got to go figure out how to do this. I'm reading docs and doing X, Y, and Z because there's not really a class or there wasn't anything available to do that. So it, it, you know, it's positive to hear that there's something that's coming out. And, you, and props to Portswigger for for making training licenses available for me to do that. Because if it wasn't, if I wasn't training Burt Pro, I wouldn't be training. Because I'm yeah. not, I, one of the things I don't like to do is go out and teach tools and techniques that I don't use myself every day. Like I literally in in in, in, in training myself out of a dog out of a job by creating clones of myself <laughs> like what you do when you come into my class i want you to walk out of there being able to do what i do using the tools that i do the approaches that i take and the techniques that i use not oh do this because the industry said industry says that's what you should do but i go do this every day right yeah. that's not how i want it to be i want it to be real so that was very important to me going into this um so thanks for sports Twitter for allowing me to do that all my training stuff is at landmaster53.com training so if they go to my website they can find my schedule and registration pages and all that stuff too. Cool. Well, and, uh, thanks and to and you. I remembered. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. All right. What were you going to say, Ken? No, go I was going to say thanks to him. I remembered to renew my license. Like I literally renewed my license <laughs> while we were on here because I was like, oh crap, I, it's going to expire in like a week or two. So <laughs> I was actually like, oh, so I went ahead and renewed it while we were on this. No joke. Well, it doesn't cost <laughs> you any more if you let it expire, Ken. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> it just won't work. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Work. Yeah. That's you know what I'm looking forward to. Situation to be in. Yeah. I'm looking forward to verbose change logs. Like I go and check them. Like, ooh, there's a, there's a new patch. Go look at the change log. And it's like, this is just a this is just a you know a periodic update and stuff. Like, ah. yeah. Yes. yeah, bug fixes. <laughs> uh, so are, uh, I'm. I mean, I like we didn't get into the core stuff. I think eventually in the future, sometime we want to have yes. you and uh, Kevin come on and talk about the cores framework and everything that you guys are doing there. Cause that's, that sounds super cool. And, oh yeah. So we gave the talk uh, last weekend at uh, B-Size Greenville mm -hmm. and it went well. I, I mean, it, it just went better than I think me and Ken both expected. In fact, Kevin, and we did the, <laughs> we did. Hey, that mean, happens to me all the time. This, man. <laughs> this was the most daring live demo I ever did. So we had servers on three different cloud platforms, Heroku, Google Cloud, and, and Amazon AWS. So we had three different servers on three different cloud platforms, and the demo required audience participation for it to work. Like all, like the, the like the four worst things you could possibly have, and it worked so well. Like it worked better than I expected. I couldn't even keep up with how fast the exploit played out and uh, and cracked this particular credentials we were after. It was a thing of beauty. And so uh, we said we that that evening we submitted it to DerbyCon. Hopefully it'll get picked up. If it does, uh, we will we will that's when we will release everything, tooling, slides, all that stuff. Otherwise, if we get rejected from DerbyCon, we'll probably push stuff out there sooner. Okay. But we would love to get on here and talk about it. I mean, it's it's fun. And, like, we got shot down by PyCon. Apparently, they don't care about security. I'm just kidding. If I'm PyCon <laughs> <laughs> but they, they, didn't, they didn't accept us. Granted, I, you know, they I sent it to the CFP, and they came back to me, and they were like, hey, uh, so what does this have to do with Python? And then I went back and looked at my CFP, and I don't think I said the word Python <laughs> once. <laughs> and I was like, oh, well. Flask application to target application, and one of the Flask libraries is 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 vulnerable. And then, of course, the framework's written in Flask. And I threw all this extra stuff in there, and they're like, "Whatever, dude." <laughs> <laughs> so we got rejected, and that's my bad, Kevin. If you're listening, man, that's totally my fault. <laughs> As always, next year. Well, yeah. now that you've shit on them, maybe not. But no, I'm kidding. You didn't. <laughs> Be fair, he did not. No, it's a bucket yeah. list thing, man. I want to speak yeah. at PyCon. Right? Yeah, PyCon's a cool conference. Like. I don't think I ever spoke though. I only did like the poster thing. I can't remember or something like that, but it's all good. Um, cool. Uh, so any, it sounds like you've got, well, you've got CFPs in for DerbyCon. Any other conferences that you're speaking at coming up? I submitted it. Well, we, well no, actually. Der, uh, DerbyCon is the only one. I got a CFT in at DerbyCon, a CFP in at DerbyCon. And then I usually try to speak at B-Size Augusta every year, which is later in the year. Um, I don't have much at all planned for the summer. So when the, once the kids get out of school, I typically take it easy and and uh, play dad for a couple of months and do things here and there, but um, in vacation when I can. But uh, yeah, other than that, no. I would say keep an eye on uh, keep an eye on my Twitter and an eye on my training page, and I'll I'll post any any talks I give or places I speak. Cool. Sounds good. All right. We hope you feel better. Yeah, yeah me too. 
Yeah, thanks. all this talking is like drying me out, man. I'm gonna go drink a huge glass of water when I get done, and I need to go pick up my medication at some point too. Oh well, we were hoping you were gonna be medicated before right? like, <laughs> going, going for the crazy. Oh, all the, I took all the over the counter stuff this morning. I got all the prescription stuff waiting on me. So yeah, I see. I see how it is. I see how yeah. it is. We wanted the landmaster that's seeing leprechauns. That's what we yeah. wanted. Oh man, my eyes are all red. I don't know if you guys can tell. <laughs> yeah. People are like, man, that guy's a stoner, man. He must have been token up before he got on the podcast. No, I'm not a stoner. I've got sinus issues. <laughs> it could be yeah. both. No, <laughs> <laughs> no but we, we appreciate you coming on, man. It's always good to catch up and then also get your you know feedback on different things. So keep up the good work. And um, I mean, we have been going for an hour, so you know, it always goes by pretty quick. And but yeah, we appreciate it. Uh, like any any recommendations, like final like thoughts for people, you know, just in general. Um, so I, I I did start a new company recently with a couple of friends. Um, people that have heard me speak before or have been in social circles with me know how I feel about mentorship and how strong I, I believe in mentorship. And um, I think that is definitely something we all need to be doing, both providing and receiving mentorship at all all points in time. But the mentorship relationship is is uh um can be difficult at certain times you know like a lot of folks that are closer to the top than they are to the bottom often find a difficulty finding good mentors uh people that can mentor them um some of the folks that are towards the bottom sometimes a lot of time those mentorship opportunities don't really provide don't really uh they don't have people necessarily that they feel like they can mentor and then other people they look for in mentorship a lot of times will say well you're just not there yet do these couple of things and then maybe i could be your official mentor I mean, so mentorship has its complexities and so I'm a friend of mine who is a uh, an avid entrepreneur. He's helped start and and work with like 17 different cybersecurity companies or whatever. He's been really involved in that. Um, has has been using these things called masterminds over the past uh, couple of years, and these are essentially small groups of people that um, sit together, and it's a structured gathering, right? It's a structured gathering where people will, where people will sit together, and each person has a role, and you've got time limits and you speak and you talk through problems and you work out and you work in these different roles together. Um, and it's a, it's, it's, it's not mentorship, but it definitely is an incubator for individual growth, right? Through that, you have opportunities to learn the soft skills that frankly, no one teaches or very few people teach and that are hard to come by, but those soft skills are often what our technicians are missing to take that next step professionally. And so this is a good opportunity to learn those professional skills because you're leading in the group at times, you're following in the group at times, you are speaking and writing in the group at times. Um, but essentially what we're doing is, is we're putting together masterminds that are specific for cybersecurity professionals, both people that are in the industry, those that could be cybersecurity business owners. So you could have five cybersecurity business owners in a mastermind together, solving problems and getting better at their craft and getting better at running businesses, not necessarily just hacking a web application, right? And then you have folks that could be, you know, a mechanic from over here and a pharmacist from over there that just really want to get into cybersecurity, making up another mastermind over here that they're sharing ideas on how to get into the industry on how to build their uh, their profession and their personal brands and things like that. And so we kind of remove the hierarchy of mentor and mentee and introduce this group think approach to advancing in cybersecurity careers. And so uh, it's called Cyber Masterminds. If you go to cybermasterminds.com, you can sign up. Um, right now, we're just collecting individuals that want to be a part of this and beginning to group them together. Uh, we'll be beginning to group them together and, and match them. And there will be a whole matching process. There'll be an algorithm involved, probably some questionnaires as well that match people with the right other folks so that everyone gets maximum benefit out of being in that particular group. And then we'll add incentive systems and stuff like that as things move forward. But um, we really just want to bring this idea of masterminds out of this executive level place where it is right now and introduce it to an entire industry and see how that helps folks uh, grow in their profession. I encourage you to check it out, sign up, and shoot me any email or anything, or hit me up on Twitter if you have any questions about it, because we're we're starting to build the first groups now. Cool. No, that's a, yeah, that sounds useful. I, you know, it, 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 like a lot of the, I think of meetups and things like that, and that's always kind of the difficult thing is that you're you're looking for something that is more of a give and take and not necessarily just a presentation. Exactly. 
It, it's it certainly a give and take, and it'll all be online, so you don't necessarily have to be somewhere to do it. It'll be Zoom sessions or however you, you get to decide the medium you want to use, right? Your group does. Um, and so uh, we'll step in and guide the first couple of meetings to kind of show you the process and how it works and where the benefits are and the advantages. And then we really feel like once folks, once folks grasp that, get a handle on it, that uh, it's really going to help certain, uh, it's going to help everybody involved grow professionally and individually. Cool. Good. Yeah, we'll, we'll post some links to that too. Um, cool. But good. Uh, yeah, I don't. Yeah, I don't necessarily have any other questions for today, um, but we will. We would love to have you back on to talk about the core stuff eventually when you and Kevin are up to it. Um, and but we really appreciate you taking the time. You know, I, especially when you're sick. You know, well, I appreciate you guys having me. Like, I, it's been too long. Like, I enjoyed the talking, as you can tell. So yeah. <laughs> even when I'm sick, I even still enjoy talking. Uh, Sweet, cool. Um, thanks, guys. Appreciate it. Yeah, thanks. Uh, I don't think there's anything else, Ken, unless you've got any other announcements. We'll just see people online. No, just thanks for, again, for joining us. Appreciate it. Okay. All right. Thanks, everybody.